Street. All right, here we go. Game two. Mavericks and Clippers will be tomorrow night. Eventually, they move that series back to Dallas. Mavericks winning the first game 113 to 103 and uh, had a great first quarter offensively and eventually win it. I think outscored the Clippers in every quarter in that game. We're now joined by the television broadcast voice and face of the Mavericks in Mark Folliwell. Mark, uh, I, I just had a good feeling about the series. I Maybe because of how Dallas was playing and getting Porzingis back or whatever. Your thoughts about getting that first one, getting that first game? and, and Do most series, if you steal a win, come in game one or not? Well, I think most series, yeah, if you get a best of seven series, I think uh, about 76% of the time the game one winner goes on to win the series. Uh, but that does leave, you know, 24, 25% of the time where it doesn't happen. And it's, you know, it's going to be tough to, to win three more games against the Clippers. But look, I felt good about it going into the series, not necessarily saying I was predicting a win or anything like that, but I certainly felt like that the Mavs would hold their own against them. And to me, the benefit of winning game one of the series, beyond the obvious things about, you know, taking home court advantage and, and, you know, not having to chase the series after the first game, uh, you know, for, for this young team, uh, that doesn't have players who have a lot of playoff experience. I mean, there's some guys who have been on some other teams like Josh Richardson and Tim Hardaway, but we're not talking about anybody who's had a long, deep run to the conference finals or NBA finals or anything like that. JJ Reddick has, but he's not playing right now. He's, he's hurt. So he's not in the mix. But it's just it's important, I think, from a standpoint of this team beat you last year. Uh, you've shown now that you're an improved team, and you hit first in the series. I think they hit first in the game the other day. I heard you when I was coming on talking about how well they played in the first quarter. I think that was very, very important to, to establish that at the beginning of the series and not be the reactive team, but be the team that sets the tone at the beginning of the first game. So there's a lot of things I liked about how they played. And, look, the bottom line is, uh, this team, this, this franchise that had a team in the playoffs won a game one in a series since 2011. They lost six straight games, game one. They haven't led in the playoff series since 2014 when they were leading San Antonio 2-1 in a series that they ended up losing in seven games. So it's just on many, many levels, very, very positive what happened on Saturday. Mark, uh, you mentioned them, you know, that, that, that first you know, shot that first quarter, that first thing. Does that kind of prove that the Clippers aren't still in their dome from last year a little bit? Yes, I think that, uh, number one, I think it proves that the Clippers aren't in their head from last year. That's uh, that's one aspect of it. And I also wonder how much uh, it speaks to the Clippers' own mental state. Uh, there's probably a lot of pressure on them right now. That's, that's everything that you read and hear coming out of Los Angeles, that there already was pressure after collapsing in the playoffs against Denver in the second round last year and basically playing an entire regular season of, well, it really doesn't mean anything because what you need to do is be successful in the playoffs because that's what the team is constructed to do. So I think there's probably, and then, of course, there's a lot of negative talk and a lot of eyes on them because the perception is that they didn't exactly try their best in their last couple of games with the idea of, you know, who knows how much of that was Maverick-related, who knows, it seems to me that a lot more people think it was related to avoiding the Lakers for as long as possible. Uh, I think there are some flaws in that strategy, but maybe that's another discussion for another time. But anyway, I think there's probably a lot uh, of of belief that uh, the Clippers aren't, you know, a, a mentally strong team. Now, adversity and experiencing what they're experiencing right now could make them mentally strong and they could come together and they could play great tomorrow and it could be the springboard to playing very well and winning the rest and, and winning the series uh we'll have to wait and see how it all plays out but but i think from the mass perspective yes uh the performance the other day certainly demonstrated that there's no negative lingering effects from what happened from losing to the clippers last year in the playoffs mark did you feel that edginess there in game number one and do you anticipate that to to carry over into game number two is that what's going to be important for the Mavs is to not get too into the the drama of what's going on outside of the lines you know I honestly to be to be perfectly honest I didn't sense a ton of edges the okay. other day uh you know I was concerned about that going into the series given all of what happened last year with Porzingis getting ejected and Morris and Luca and and Beverly and you know just everything that happened over the course of the six game series last year and that Really, very, very little of that occurred on on Saturday. There was one play in the fourth quarter where there was a foul call, and Finney Smith didn't want to give the ball up immediately, and Rondo tried to grab it from him. And you know, you guys have watched enough basketball to know that players don't like when another player tries to grab the ball out of their hands, so mm -hmm. they can start headed the other way with it. So that uh, 
I got everybody flustered for a few seconds. But beyond that, I thought that uh, there wasn't nearly the amount of chippiness I expected. That doesn't mean that things won't change tomorrow night. Maybe that will be a strategy for the Clippers uh, to get the Mavs off their game, perhaps. But at least on Saturday, I didn't sense a whole lot of that, and that was a pleasant surprise that the focus was just good, hard, competitive playoff basketball and not drama and not other things. So, you know, it's the playoffs, so of course I'm sure that that won't last much longer, but at least on Saturday I was very pleasantly surprised that it was just a a well-played, hard-fought game between two very good teams. If Finney Smith does does anything similar to what he did in game one, because he went off at 18, I think it was, had maybe four threes, if they get that kind of contribution within – let's say 12 to 18 points a game. What does that put them, Mark? Hard to beat if they do that, man. That's their, if they get production like that from a player who's not counted on to score and he continues to play the aggressive, hard-nosed, competitive defense that he plays all the time. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to stop people that, that are the talent level of Kawhi and Paul George. I mean, I, I, you know, we say on our telecast a lot of times when shots are made that it's good defense, better offense. That's life in the NBA. So uh, the main thing is Dorian, though, it just has to make those guys work for everything that they get. And then if he does that on defense and then puts up the number of points that you're talking about on the board at the other end of the floor and does it efficiently, uh, efficiently, that is, like he did the other day, then, yeah, that, that's, I'm not, that, that means no guarantee, but that makes the Mavs a much more difficult team to beat when you couple that with what you expect game in, game out of Luka what you expect game in, game out of Tim Hardaway Jr., and hopefully, uh, you know, a better game out of Porzingis moving forward. What do they need? Where, where does Porzingis need to go to really take this team, help take this team to that next level? Well, I, it's going to be hard to win a series if he is averaging 14 points and shooting four for 13. Uh, that means other people are really going to have to step up. Now, you know, when you look back at the game the other day, um, you know, one of the things that the Clippers are doing to, to try to, uh, you know, deal with Luka is, okay, we'll put Kawhi Leonard on Porzingis. Uh, that way, whenever pick and rolls happen between Luka and Porzingis, then Kawhi gets switched on to Luka. We know the Mavericks don't want that. So the Mavs avoided that by just involving other people in pick and rolls. And that put Porzingis in sort of a decoy, out of the play situation to, to draw Kawhi Leonard's attention away from Luka and away from the heart of the action on offense. So, you know, um, how they're going to end up using Porzingis for the rest of the series, I guess, remains to be seen. Uh, The better he plays, I mean, look, I I think we all understand the better he plays and the more that he can provide unicorn-type things, uh, then the better chance they have to win the series. I I don't think it's realistic that he can spend all of the series being a decoy just to keep Kawhi Leonard away. I'm sure the Clippers will counter that, and when they counter that, then that's going to mean somebody else is guarding him, and he's going to have to exploit that matchup or take advantage of that in whatever way makes sense. So uh, I don't know that I necessarily have a number or anything like that, but, but for a realistic chance to win the series, I think clearly they're going to need him to be better than the 14 points and 4 for 13 he had the, the other day. Mark, what's it been like to follow Luca? You know, these last couple of years on a nightly basis. Oh man, uh, it's it's gosh. Um, what I enjoy about it so much is that there's an element of you don't know what he's going to do next. Uh, there's an element of must see TV about it. That uh, you know the the his, the numbers have been historic. And it's great to be able to throw up all the graphics on the air about he's doing things that only Oscar Robertson or Magic Johnson or Russell Westbrook or uh, Wilt Chamberlain or whomever had done at a young age or, you know, at so few number of games into the league or whatever. Those things are neat. But, but beyond the numbers, look, you know, we're, we want joy from our sports and we want entertainment from our sports. And so Luca plays with an element of joy that I think is infectious to people that are on the floor playing with him. And it's just to people that are watching him play the game. And so you get this just element of what is he going to do next? He plays the game with, uh, you know, some entertainment value and showmanship and flair. And there's just a lot of lot, lots to like about him from all of those regards. So I guess, you know, when I think about what it's been like to watch the first three years of his career, the fact that he was so ready to immediately jump in and have success. 
uh, when obviously a lot of people doubted, well, how is this guy going to go from 18 years old at Real Madrid to playing and having success in the NBA? The fact that he's done that and done it at a high level and you know adapted to all of the things that you have to adapt to, moving from one country to another at a young age, changing leagues, styles of play in the leagues, and all of those sorts of things. And he's had success at it, and he's had success at it in a way that I think when you watch it, uh, you know, it's just there's there's a tremendous level of entertainment value in it and excitement in it, and and the idea that I have to watch because is this guy going to have a forty point triple double? Is he going to hit a bunch of threes? What sort of fantastic passes is he going to make that cause the crowd to ooh and off? Those sorts of kind of plays, um, you know, that's that's I think the reward of getting to watch. Luca up close on a night in, night out basis like I do. Mark Folliwell, uh, Mavericks TV play by play. Rick Carlisle is a championship player, championship coach. But it's mm-hmm. kind of amazing. And he's kind of been through this latest rebuild, but they have not won a playoff series since they won the NBA championship. It's been yep. missed playoffs or first round exit. Is there any, not, uh, you know, you hear that word pressure. Is there anything to him feeling? that this team needs to get out of the first round, even though they are technically a sixth seed compared to our, against who the Clippers are, the third seed? Well, uh, last week, uh, a question along those lines came up to Rick in one of his uh, pregame Zooms, one of his post-practice Zooms, I guess, last week before the series got started. And he said, I've been getting a lot of questions about pressure to win a series. And he said, hell yes, there's pressure to win a series. And we want pressure. We like pressure. We want to find a way to make pressure our friends. Because ultimately, you know, we don't want to be a team that hasn't gotten out of the first round in 10 years. We want to get out of the first round, but we want to do a lot more than that. We preach championship habits and championship mindset as an organization. And that's kind of what our goal is year in, year out. Now, there are some years when clearly that's not a very realistic goal. Uh, but I do think that Rick, you know, obviously does it. I don't think he feels pressure from a anything like a job security standpoint, anything along those lines. I think Rick is just a guy that's in it to win it at the highest level, and he's driven, and he's been a part of success, as you noted, as a player and as a coach, and I think that he badly wants to bring the organization back to the level that that he had them at 10 years ago. So uh, the pressure that he feels, I think, is just the pressure from a guy who has uh, a tremendous internal drive to be the best that he can possibly be. And as I said, he's in it to win it at the highest level. So, uh, you know, he doesn't want to accept mediocrity or anything along those lines. Uh, but, but, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's pressure or anything like that in a, a hot seat kind of way or negative kind of way. I think it's just the pressure of we hold ourselves to higher expectations around here. And, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to meet those expectations. I thought when Kali Leonard arrived in L.A. that he would bring a toughness to them, uh, you know, that meat, potatoes type Greg Popovich and what he did in Toronto mentality. Right. Has he been able to do that with them? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, not seeing them day in, day out, I don't know how qualified I am to answer that, just kind of watching it from a distance. Uh I would say the jury's still out on that, to be mm-hmm. perfectly honest with you. I, I, I guess at the end of the day, I mean, again, uh, I, I'm not trying to avoid the question. It's just probably a little harder for me to answer not being there all the time and being around them. But the best answer I suppose I would give is um, we won't know the answers of that until we see what they do in these playoffs. And, and you know, given their uh, catastrophic exit last year, then – uh, to that point, clearly he hadn't brought that sort of meat and potatoes toughness that you're talking about, talking about to them. And whether or not he's brought that to them this year remains to be seen based on what happens in the rest of this series and if they advance the remainder of the playoffs. But, you know, I, I guess that's, uh, that's kind of harsh to say that you're judged on championship or bust. But, look, they put a team together and made a lot of trades and gave up a lot of draft capital. And, and brought in veteran players. I mean, this is not a young team. I think by average age, as a matter of fact, the Clippers are the oldest team in the NBA. Uh, all of their core players are, you know, outside of Kawhi being 29 and Zubats being 24, all of their core players are in their 30s. So yeah, I, I think the, the success of their playoff run will dictate what the answer is to your question about the level of toughness and uh, just that, that uh, meat and potatoes way of playing. If, if, if they have success in the playoffs at the highest level, 
then the answer to your question would be yes. If they don't, then then you would have to say the answer to the question is no. He hasn't had the desired impact on it. Mark, uh, final thing. Uh, I was watching the Knicks game, and just to hear you know the the fans going crazy, and, and yeah. just the, the fans in general. What's it been like to just hear fans and, and kind of have some of that playoff feel back, even though it's at reduced capacity in most places. Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing about that Knicks game yesterday is, and, and you know, I'm, I'm going to do something I don't do very often, which is kind of be hard on what somebody else is doing from a broadcast standpoint, because I think, you know, we all know that we're all out there trying to do the best we can with this stuff. But I was disappointed in listening to their game yesterday, because I thought the crowd was mixed too low. Mm-hmm. And so it was hard to get a feel for how electric it must have been there in Madison Square Garden, even with what limited crowd noise we got, just the images and the way everything was going. It certainly seemed like uh, it was great there yesterday. I mean, gosh, it's their first playoffs in 2013. So how could it not be, right? Right. Uh, so I hope that uh, some of the sound mixing on some of these playoff games that are on these, you know, I mean, obviously we're doing a local telecast on, on Valley Sports Southwest here in Dallas, Fort Worth, but I hope some of the, the sound mixing on some of these playoff games is better because I think people are dying to hear that. We've missed that for so long now, and we want to see and hear and feel the energy of a big crowd. That that's that's really important. Um, so in our case, you know, uh, we could certainly notice it whenever they started letting four thousand people into the games here at American Airlines Center this year. Uh, that made a difference from you know the first six weeks of the season or whatever it was that we were playing games here that there wasn't a crowd. And I know the players like it. And now the Mavs games are going to get up to 15,000 people is what they're saying here at American Airlines Center or somewhere in that neighborhood anyway when the games and the series shift back to here for Friday and Sunday for games three and four. Uh, you know, they're only playing with 6,000 in front of 6,000 people right now at the Staples Center. I think the announced crowd for the Clipper game the other day was 6117. And when the Lakers played that playoff game last week, it was 6,022 is what the crowd was. So the, the crowds are still kind of small out in Los Angeles. Uh, but, but, you know, any crowd is a, is a, is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. And, and what we expect to see in Dallas, since it will be by far the biggest crowd that we've had here since, uh, that, that, uh, unforgettable night of March 11th, 2020, when, you know, we had the game here against Denver and it was the last game that was completed that night before the league shut down. So to, to have the fans is, there's there's nothing but great things about it, and obviously the hope up here is that with the bigger crowd here, that will mean more of a home court advantage for the Mavs in their home games against the Clippers. We shall see. Mark, thank you very much. Thanks for being on with us today. Good luck with the broadcast as well the rest of the way and possibly more than just the one series right now. one nothing Dallas over the Clippers winning in L.A., and Game 2 is tomorrow night. When we come back, a couple